right, so we are starting our recording. This is chapter 19, Global Change, second to last chapter. Uh, this is a big one for us. Uh, this is, they said this is not going to be on the AP test this year just because most schools haven't gotten to it yet. But we have been talking about a lot of stuff going on for global change all year long. And this is kind of the sum it up chapter where we sum everything up. But we've actually been talking about most of what is in this chapter all year long. So I don't know how they're going to kind of completely cut it out other than the AP test is just two AP FRQs. So there's no multiple choice. So they're not going to ask a ton about it. But I can see like these topics. We've covered these topics over and over all year long. So let's get right into this. So this is chapter 19, Global Change. And we will go from here. Oop, I think I'm on the wrong slide. Let's come over here. There we go. All right, global change. Oops, it went two ways. All right, global change. We have kind of our umbrella, our blanket is called global change, and there's a lot of things that fall underneath global change. Uh, any chemical, biological, or physical property change of the planet. Examples include cold temperatures causing ice ages. So global change is kind of a over, an umbrella that comes over everything, and right under that we could put climate. When we're talking about global change, we can talk about the climate changing. So global climate change, this would be the changes in the climate of the earth. And then under that, need that, we could add this to global warming would be right under that. So global warming would be a type of climate change. So one aspect of climate change, the warming of the oceans, land masses, and atmosphere of the earth. So this is one of the key points of environmental science is talking about global change, but then it can bro be broken down into many different little categories after that. One of the main ones we talk about, you hear in the news all the time anyway, is about global warming and what is global warming and how does global warming work. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about that in today's notes. So if there isn't anybody who hasn't heard about the greenhouse effect yet, let me be the first to tell you, here's the greenhouse effect. Uh, if we had a multiple choice section, it would 100% be on there because it's on every single AP test that's ever been. And now this is looks like it's not going to be on this one because it's said that greenhouse effect isn't going to be there. This is when radiation from the sun hits the earth. One third is reflected back. So we have the sun and all the other stars out there uh, sending radiation towards the earth. And what it does when it gets to the earth, a third of it bounces off the top of our atmosphere and bounces back into space. The other two thirds travel in. Some of the UV radiation is absorbed by the ozone layer. This is why the stratospheric ozone layer is so important. It basically stops uh, to, uh, it's basically there to stop the UV radiation from coming into earth and strikes the earth where it is converted into low energy infrared radiation. So UV radiation turns into infrared radiation, UV into IR. The infrared radiation then goes back towards the atmosphere where it is absorbed by greenhouse gases that radiate most of it back to the earth. So once it comes in, it goes from UV into IR, it then bounces back up and all the greenhouse gases, which we're gonna talk about in just a second what they actually are, they then absorb the IR radiation and heat up the atmosphere. And that's the, when we talk about the greenhouse effect, it's the heating up of all these greenhouse gases where they're catching all that IR uh, radiation and heating up the planet that way. But I've got a diagram here that I want to show you that basically is ex explaining this. So for number one up here, we have the incoming solar radiation. As it comes in, a third of it gets reflected. A third of this gets reflected back where two thirds travels in. And about as it comes in, you have your ozone layer your ozone layer that is going to basically protect you from a lot of this. But those that get through, the UV radiation will come down, bounce off, go from UV radiation to IR radiation, infrared radiation. And as it travels back up, you have this greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. And these greenhouse gases are then absorbing the IR radiation, and that is what's heating up the atmosphere. And either heating up the atmosphere or having it bounce right back towards the Earth again. And so it's coming back to the Earth again, heating up the, the planet that way. So that is the greenhouse effect, very, greenhouse effect very quickly explained. So what are greenhouse gases? One of the mistakes a lot of students make is think that every gas that's in the atmosphere is a greenhouse gas. And where many of them are greenhouse gases, not every gas is a greenhouse gas. These are the main ones that the uh, AP test looks at. It is water vapor. We're never going to get rid of water vapor. We need to have water vapor. That's what helps, gives us rain. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone. I would put particulate matter and I would put CFCs in here also. These are two more of our uh, greenhouse gases. So major greenhouse gases, and this is just a chart from your book that you can look at later also. Uh, number one, it, it's in, in here we've got greenhouse gases, gases concentrations in 2010. 
global warming potential. This is how potential they are, that these are the ones that are going to cause the most problems for us with global warming, and then how long they stay. So water vapor is number one. It variables with var uh, it's variable with temperature. It's the least amount that's going to cause global warming because it doesn't stay but maybe nine days in the atmosphere before it turns into rain and rains back down to the planet. Carbon dioxide, which is one of the ones we talk about a whole lot. We've talked all year long about CO2 uh, parts per million. And this is in 2010, and it was at 390 parts per million. Before I started recording this today, that was I'm drooling on myself a little bit, uh, I looked, and we've looked at this the parts per million all year long. Right now, as of today, we were at 415 parts per million. So in 2020, in 10 years, we went from 390 to 415. That's a 25 parts per million increase. That's a lot. And you're going to see graphs that we're going to look at in a little bit that what we're at today won't even fit on the graphs that are in the book. Uh, global warming potential, this is actually pretty small compared to what we're comparing uh, these others to. It's highly variable ranging from years to hundreds of years, depending on uh, several factors. Methane, which is 1.8 part per million, which is much less. The thing is, is it's a much higher risk of global warming because of how long it will stay for 12 years. And then you have nitrous oxides, which come from fossil fuels, 0.3, very small amount, but a much higher potential because it stays for at least 100 years. And then you have our CFCs, our chlorofluorocarbons that we've talked about in previous chapters that can stay up to greater than 500 years in the atmosphere. All right, there are natural causes of greenhouse gases. That is volcanic eruptions, mainly carbon dioxide, methane from decomposition, nitrous oxides from uh, denitrification, and water vapor is just naturally occurring. We talk about the water cycle in here all the time. But we mostly want to talk about our anthropogenic. Remember, anthropogenic is human causes of greenhouse gases. The number one for us is burning of fossil fuels. Uh, we burn a whole lot of fossil fuels now, uh, and you're going to see a breakdown in a minute of another chart that I have of what the burning of fossil fuels is emitting. Agricultural practices are fertilizers and all of the feces that are created from uh, different agricultural practices with livestock, deforestation, landfills, which we've already covered in industrial production, such as CFCs, and there's a whole gamut of other things, but CFCs are the main ones that the AP test looks at. So these are all the different things that can help create greenhouse gases that are anthropogenic that we're looking at right now because we plant all of our crops and we use all these fertilizers and we have all this livestock and we create all these landfills and we burn all these uh, fossil fuels and factories and cars and for energy and stuff like that, creating all these greenhouse gases. So where do each one of these come from? So I'm going to hit methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide here. The number one cause of methane that we put into our atmosphere comes from livestock, namely cows. Cows are number one producer, followed very closely by landfills. We produce a lot of methane from our landfills because as our garbage basically breaks down, it breaks down into and releases methane. And then natural gas and petroleum is the third one right there. But you see a lot of li livestock is the number one. If we cut back on the amount of beef that we eat, it will cut back on the amount of methane. Because if we don't buy the beef, we won't be uh, growing as many cows. Or raising as many cows, I should say. Not really growing. It's not like they're on a tree or something. Uh, number two is nitrous oxide over here. And that comes from our agricultural soils. Nitrous oxide is going to be from creating our fertilizers, our synthetic fertilizers. And that was the main one by far. And then the third one down here is carbon dioxide. And if you look at carbon dioxide, number one and number two are both using fossil fuels. It's just what are the fossil fuels being used for? So you have fossil fuels used for energy. That is creating energy for us. That's our power plants. We are burning coal at a very high rate. We're doing all this to create energy for ourselves. That's number one. Number two is fossil fuels not used for energy. That is going to be driving our cars, heating our houses, things like all the other ways that we use fossil fuels after that. All right, now increases in carbon dioxide concentrations. And if you look at the graph right here, you can see from about 1960 on, and this we our data here is goes to 2010, and we're now in 2020. If you look at the graph, where we are right now, where I said this is carbon dioxide parts per million, we would be up here above the graph because this basically looks like it's stopping at 400 parts per million and we're above 400 parts per million now. You can see that this graph is has a positive slope, meaning it's increasing the monthly trends and overall trends as it is started measuring back in 1958 and it has not slowing down. 
All right, emissions from developed and developing countries. So if we're gonna look down here at the bottom, we have millions of metric tons of carbon dioxide, and then we have per capita metric tons. So remember, per capita is basically per person. So if you're just gonna look at the amount that each country makes, China and the United States are one and two by a lot. But when we break it down to per capita, and we look at per person, the United States is still number two, but China drops way off because if you look at their per capita, they don't they have way more people than the United States does. They're over almost to 1.5 billion people where we're at 300 million people. They are way higher than we are. Five times as many people, but we are still creating using more uh, emissions of carbon dioxide than they are if we look at it per person. Where Australia is up here, if we go to per person, there's not as many people that live in Australia. If you look over here, Australia is way down here if you look at the amount, but if you look at per person, they're number one. All right, global temperatures. So we climate, we talked to climate change and global climate, global warming. Since 1880, temperatures have increased 0.8 degrees Celsius. That's about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't seem like a lot until you look at the global scale and how things can change when you're looking at uh, temperature changes like that. That means it's an average. That means what happens is, is the places that don't need that change get an even higher change, which I'm talking about the North and South Poles. Those are where the temperatures are changing the most. And so you're melting way more ice because the temperatures are changing more than our 0.8 degrees Celsius or 1.4 degrees of Fahrenheit. So if you look at this, it's gone up and down and up and down since about 1880 all the way to 2010, and you can see the temperature rise as that happens. Uh, I'm not as worried about this graph. I've got another graph that's similar to this later on, so we'll talk about that one when I get to it. I'm going to skip this for right now. So this is one that I actually get a lot from students, and whenever I talk to people that, that learn that I the teach uh, environmental science, they want to know, well, how do you know what the atmosphere was like? How do you know it was in the water back then? How do you know all this stuff? Well, one of the main things we do is we have ice that is that old, that we have ice that has been around way longer than we've been here, and it's been frozen. So one of the, one of the ways that we look at stuff is we dig into this ice and we look up the chemical composition of what all is in the ice, because if it was in the ice, it was in the water at that time. And if it was in the water, remember, water is a sink for what is in the air. Whatever is in our atmosphere uh, basically finds its way into our water system, and so we can find out what's in the atmosphere if we know what's in the water. So we can check in species composition, chemical analysis of this ice, and it tells us everything we need to know about what the atmosphere and what the water was like, how it, when we carbon date and figure, find out how old this ice is. So you, I've shown you this graph before. If you are going to continue on with and, and take an environmental science class, you will probably see this graph more and more. It shows up in most of the documentaries that are done over environmental science. This graph finds its way in here. It's, it's a pretty famous graph. It's been used in, to teach environmental science for a very long time now. So if you look at this, we go back over 400,000 years of time, and it's looking at carbon dioxide parts per million. So. As you can see, the carbon dioxide has been ebbing and flowing up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down until we get to, and we've talked about this dozens of times now, what happens right here? Industrial revolution. And all of a sudden we're burning more fossil fuels than ever before. Because if, if we look here, most of this time there were no fossil fuels being burnt. For all, oops, I need to go back. Uh, fossil fuels being burned. And so this is what naturally would occur without any fossil fuels over the last 400,000 years. Once we start burning fossil fuels, it spikes because we're putting even more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And if you look at this, this tapers off at 400 parts per million. Well, are we at 400? No, we're gonna be up here now. We're above 400 parts per million. It won't even fit on this graph. So putting it together, what does all this mean? We know that an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes a greater capacity for warming through the greenhouse effect. We're putting more greenhouse gases out there, one of them being carbon dioxide, and it warms the atmosphere. When the Earth experiences higher temperatures, the oceans warm and cannot contain as much CO2 gas, and as a result, they release CO2 in the atmosphere. As we warm the atmosphere, we're also warming the oceans. And as the oceans get warmer, the oceans are a sink for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is supposed to go in and out of the oceans, in and out of the oceans. Well, as they warm up, they can't hold as much carbon dioxide, meaning even more carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere. So 
it's even pushing more carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere because we're warming our oceans up. Also, remember, uh, putting more carbon dioxide into the oceans also causes carbonic acid, which is eating away at shells of shellfish. This is one, uh, it doesn't show up in as many textbooks, but is one that I think says more to the doubters of global warming, because we still have a lot of politicians and a lot of people around the world that don't believe global warming is real. And this is whenever I talk about this with other people, this is a graph I try and bring up, because on one side I have carbon dioxide parts per million. This is that same time frame we were looking at before for 400,000 years. So this is a lot of data that we have to look at. And over here we have temperature change compared to present day temperatures. And if you look, we're looking at carbon dioxide parts per million, time, and temperature change. And we're gonna look and see what they do together. Are they we're doing the same thing? Are they opposite? What's going on? So as you see that carbon dioxide goes down, temperature goes down. As carbon dioxide goes up, temperature goes up. As it goes down, temperature goes down. As it goes up, temperature goes up. And you can see the correlation over 400,000 years of science and looking at this, that over 400,000 years, there is a direct correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the raising and lowering of temperatures. All right, this is the graph I said I wanted to look at that looked like the other one earlier. This, and again, is looking at carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. This is, this is an estimate looking at the next 10 years, 2020 to 2029. And this is gonna be for a low increase in carbon dioxide, a moderate increase in carbon dioxide, and then a high increase in carbon dioxide. So that's what this, this column is going to be for 2020 to 2029. There isn't a whole lot of change in the next 10 years. This is the estimate. The next column over here is 2090 to 2099. So when we branch out, we add another 60 to 70 years to this. Uh, all of a sudden, you can see a large change if we keep, this is even with a low increase in carbon dioxide through, amount, through that time. Look at the temperature changes that we're looking at down here. The amount of temperature change and this can be very dramatic for many species on the planet especially if we stay with high increase you're going to see a very large change in temperatures over the next 60 to 70 years which you might go oh i'm not going to be around in 60 to 70 years you could be i'm probably not going to be i don't think i'm going to live to be 110 120 but are you going to have children are you going to have grandchildren because they will definitely be around for this and to see all this all right, like I said, feedback loops come back all the time on the AP test, and this is an example of those. Uh, looking at the positive feedback loop here, higher levels of carbon dioxide promote higher temperatures, so higher temperatures lead to faster decomposition. The more decomposition you have, it boosts the rate of CO2 because CO2 goes off with decomposition, so you're basically having a positive feedback loop. As things decompose, you have more CO2, more CO2, it leads to faster decomposition, yada yada, keeps going. Negative feedback loop. Increase atmospheric carbon dioxide incre increases plant growth. So the more carbon dioxide, plants like carbon dioxide, so you're gonna get more plants. Increase in plant growth increases uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, thereby decreasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So negative feedback loop. The more CO2 I have, the more plants I have, the more plants I have, the more CO2 I take out of the atmosphere. And then that's a negative feedback loop. One of the talks, the negative effects of this because of deforestation and, like, and a lot of the clear cutting that's going on, we are losing a lot of what will take out the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's one of the things that we talk about throughout the whole class with deforestation is we're kind of, not, one, we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere, but two, to piggyback on top of that, we are getting rid of what actually will take the CO2 out of the atmosphere also. Consequences to the environment because of global warming. These are all things that can happen to the environment because if we keep the trend up of more global warming, melting of polar ice caps, Greenland and Antarctica, Antarctica, we are already losing tons and tons of our ice in, our, in, polar, in glaciers around the world are melting. Permafrost is melting. And we talked about permafrost is where a lot of our ancient methane is already stored and we're releasing even more methane up from the permafrost. Rising of sea levels due to melting of glaciers and ice sheets and water around the world. Heat waves, cold spells, Change in precipitation patterns, increase in storm intensity, shift in ocean currents, all this we talked about thermal halines back in chapter two or three, I can't even remember right now. But all these things, we've talked about a lot of these all year long. Uh, make sure you read this section in the book. All right, changes in global mean sea level. Sea level has risen by about 
nine inches since about 1870. Uh, and it's predicted in, uh, in the next, oh, where's my notes? Uh, by the end of the century, the prediction it's going to rise between another 7 and 23 inches. You're always going to see a range when they say this is what it's going to be. They give you a low end and a very high end, and it's usually probably somewhere in between. They say that it, by the end of the century, it could raise, uh, raise it between 7 and 23 inches, which is going to do, uh, cause a lot of problems around the world with other species and the amount of land that's going to end up, be, end up being covered because of that. Consequences to living organisms as we have global warming and as everything has changes, wild plants and animals can be affected. The growing season for plants has changed and animals have to put have the potential to be harmed if they can't move to better climates. Humans may have to relocate. Some diseases like those carried by mosquitoes could increase and have uh, could become economic consequences. We have some species on the planet that their birthing cycles and their migratory cycles are all based on weather and how the atmosphere feels. Uh, one of the, the, the example I want to give you is uh, uh, birds and caterpillars and different things that form uh, uh, cat uh, with caterpillars and cocoons and things like that. Uh, the season for caterpillars uh, basically is based on temperature. And since temperature has changed, our growing season has changed, we're actually planting crops two weeks earlier than we used to historically. And also caterpillars are actually being born uh, because of this and everything is being born two weeks earlier but not all species travel by what the temperature and how the atmosphere feels birds are not they're basically set in their cycle of when they lay their eggs and whenever and all that how that happens and whenever the the chicks hatch well what happened they've happened is as these caterpillars are being born and then they form their cocoons and turn into butterflies or whatever other form of species that they're going to turn into, well, what used to happen is the mother birds would come down and get the caterpillars and feed them to their young. Well, now almost all the caterpillars are already in their cocoons or they're already transforming before the chicks are born because the caterpillars are all being born earlier. So they're having to come up with a new food source for, the, for birds than what they, they have had historically with caterpillars. Controversies of climate change. This one comes up a lot. The fundamental basis of climate change that greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing and that this will lead to global warming is not in dispute. Almost every scientist understands that global warming is happening. What is unclear is how much world temperatures will increase for a given change in greenhouse gases because that depends on the feedback loops. The feedback loops will have everything to say about how quickly or how much it's going to change. Uh, there's also a lot of politicians that say that they don't think that humans are the cause of a lot of the climate change that's happening. They're saying that it would have happened anyway. But we've seen the science in here with a lot of the graphs and data that I've given you already. But a lot of things is it's increasing but people don't want to latch on to the idea that we had something to do with it a lot of times, or there's no way for anybody to give you a concrete answer on that this is how much it's going to, to increase, or this is how much it's going to decrease. They're always going to give you a range of numbers, a very low end and a very high end, and like I said, it's probably going to end up somewhere in the middle of that. So this is uh, the big controversy that comes out of this because people are always trying to, well, how much is it going to increase? How much is it going to increase? If we cut this out, how much is it going to decrease? And there's no way you can give an exact number because we have too many feedback loops that are going to have to be regulated to get exact numbers for that. Uh, this is in your book. You can take a look at this. This is the 2000 assessment of global change by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. You can read through these questions. I'm not going to cover that. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol. This is on a lot of AP tests. In 1997, representatives of the nations of the world went to Kyoto, Japan to discuss how best to control the emissions contributing to global warming. The agreement was that emissions of the greenhouse gases from all industrialized countries will be reduced to 5.2% below their 1990 levels by 2012. Has 2012 happened yet? I think it has. By a develop, uh, Developing nations did not have emissions limits imposed by the protocol. This is, was the biggest point because all in 1997, all of the... Uh, countries that went to this were ratifying it except the United States. The United States never ratified it because they said it would put them in an economic disadvantage with other countries if they did, which is true in some sense. It's true that it would put them in it because it says developing nations would not have to uh, stop their emission standards and China is still considered a developing nation and is one of the main nations that we compete with economically. 
Carbon sequestrator. How can we take carbon out of the atmosphere? An approach involving taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Some methods include storing carbon in agricultural so soils or retiring agricultural land and allowing it to become pasture or forest. Basically, stop growing stuff. Just let it be. Let it sit there, become a forest, become a grassland. Don't put any cows on it. Don't put any animals on it. Just let it go. Researchers are looking at cost-effective ways of capturing carbon dioxide from the air, from coal-burning power stations and from other emissions, to basically, whenever the carbon dioxide is produced, to grab it right then and keep it. And then that brings us to the last part. Well, once I have it, what do I do with it? What do we do with the carbon dioxide once we have it? Well, one of the things they're looking at doing is burying it into, uh, like, mines that aren't used anymore and basically pumping it down there and some people are thinking about going into the deepest part of the oceans and pumping it down there which is another problem in itself because if we put more carbon dioxide into the oceans down there it would warm the oceans and you're just warming the oceans up even more and now you're taking the parts that are even colder down there and warming those up which that would then rise that warm water would rise and whatever is down there would rise with it and here's kind of a so this is just showing what we have. We have oil rigs and stuff that could pump uh, it down. We could basically pump it underground into these caverns, but find ways that we can capture the, the CO2 and not just grow new vegetation, don't plant new crops and things like that for, for trying to capture carbon dioxide. Well, that has been the notes for chapter 19. These were a little bit longer uh, for us. So make sure you do all the assignments, get everything turned in this week. Uh, good luck and stay safe. Mm -hmm.